the fate of Shutoran is revealed, the Empire versus themselves, and we have the Rebels constructing a miniature Death Star, all in this week's episode of Star Wars Weekly. Hello everybody, my name is Star Raptor and welcome to the channel. Every week I pour out my love and passion for Star Wars and maybe a few of you want to listen to me. So this week I have three huge comics that I want to talk about. The first one is Star Wars issue number 67. This is a landmark issue. This is the final issue for Kieran Gillen's 30 issue run of this series and we have the epic conclusion to the scourging of Shutor. This is part 6 in that we have Luke, Han, and Leia they are basically trying to dismantle or deliver a crippling blow to the economy of the empire by putting this planet into a stasis where it, you know a place where it can't actually produce any more for the empire so they are at a standstill they have killed queen tora uh, trios so the leadership of this planet is now gone now it is up to luke skywalker to prevent Benthic Two Tubes and his partisans from kind of going against Leia's plan and actually going to destroy the planet, killing all the people, whereas her plan was to make it a destruction that was slowed over time to allow the innocent people to evacuate. So we are at this standpoint. We have Leia who manages to get to Benthic and talk him down to the point where they are able to kind of save the planet in a way and get out of there and that is where everything kind of absolves and we have Benthic and his partisans going their own way on a planet in the outer rim and we have our rebels returning to home one where it's hinted at is that they want to get these planets where their base is going to be and Hoth is mentioned and we end on a very happy note so that's the plot at a glance I'm going to dive into some more specifics here first off we have Tunga the changeling doing an epic sacrifice. He's taking the ship out to lure the TIE Fighters so that Chewie can get the Falcon in to rescue Lan, uh, Han, Leia, and Miarty and C-3PO, and it works. And, well, the good thing is they don't tell us that right that, that he survived. But by the end of the issue, the Isotopers, these crazy cults that witnesses Armageddon of planets, have found him, so we know he's alive. Another thing I really like is Leia and her inspiring speech. She has, I feel like every one of the characters in this issue for our big three has a moment to shine. This is definitely Leia's moment to shine. She's very inspiring, actually talking Benthic down from his kind of murderous ways, but I always thought as Benthic having like the right to his own kind of ways because it makes sense like his planet was destroyed like you'd want to take out your vengeance on somebody else's but then again Leia's in his sh same shoes whereas her planet Alderaan was destroyed but yet she doesn't want to destroy this planet completely either so there it goes it shows her her options for able to talk people down and getting right into that with the unexpected um, turn of events for Benthic Two Tubes. Now, Benthic Two Tubes has quickly become one of my favorite side characters of Star Wars, kind of like Tam Puzzle. These Rogue One characters really strike a, um, a, a moment for me that I really like them. So I thought for sure this guy was dead. I thought for sure that Luke was going to have to kill him or somebody was going to have to kill Benthic because he seems so adamant about what he wants to do that there'd be no other way to convince this guy and they would have to kill him. Or in this case, he wanted to commit suicide, or not suicide, but go down with the planet and save uh, for, you know, for hope for Jedi and whatever. But to see him actually get confronted by Han Solo, and Han Solo actually recognizes him as one of the people under Emphis Nestor and Solo, is just a great tie-in. There's been great tie-ins all throughout Star Wars, this main series, with Solo to see that kind of um, interaction between him and Han Solo saying, look, you're a good guy before with the Rebels, and now why are you this way? There's still time to change. Han Solo has, you know, convinced himself that he used to be a mercenary for you know, smuggling. He wants to kind of stay with the Rebels at this point. You know, so I like that heart-to-heart -heart with with Benthic, and we might see Benthic again. I like how they left it open-ended. Him and his partisans are going to be on the outer rim, so that's really cool. I also want to give huge props to the, uh, you know, the artist Angel Anjueta. Sorry if I butchered the name. But great job illustrating this this epic chase, and I'm going to keep saying epic because that's the best way I can describe this issue, really it is, is they are going through the core that was split in the planet of Shutoran to get past the other side of the blockade of the Imperials. That was super intense, and just the way that the artwork was you know, designed so kinetically to make me feel like I am along the ride on the Falcon through all the fire and the heat and the TIE Fighters are exploding, it's just epic. 
I also love the ending to Commander Chan uh, Kantar, or whatever his name is, the cybernetic, getting killed by Vader, and Vader just saying, like, look, you're not going to destroy an entire planet just to get the three people. I don't care who they are, even if they are the leaders of the rebellion, this is not really how we do things in the Empire, and he ends up force choking Kantar another one off the table so a thing about this issue is they've been dealing with all these loose ends well except for scar squadron unfortunately but maybe they'll come back later i'm sure they will as they always do but these characters like miarty and tunga and trios and can charlie these characters that are appearing so closely to the events of empire strike back and why they wouldn't be there during those events so i do really enjoy that because we also get the hint the tip that Hoth is one of those outposts, one of those planets that the Rebel Alliance wants to possibly have their base on. And if we know about what's coming up in the next uh, issue with the new creative team with Greg Pak as well as Phil Noto, they are going to have this arc about the Rebels splitting up and trying to lead these probes astray that we see the probes in uh, The Empire Strikes Back. So it's all leading very closely now to the Empire Strikes Back. I wouldn't be surprised by early next year if we actually start getting a crossover, especially to coincide with the 40th anniversary of the Empire Strikes Back. Maybe Lucasfilm has been planning this all along, and that's why it's been taking this long to get there. So anyway, moving to my last kind of uh, positive on these issues. It was all positive. Yeah, big surprise there. But I, I know I really did enjoy this issue. But getting into my last point here is with that last closing shot of the Falcon and everybody saying, you know, it's their next planet, Hoth, is going to be their home. And you see Luke and Han and Leia all in an embrace looking at the boarding ramp of the Falcon. And you see, you know, Chewie and C-3PO and R2-D2. And that really hit me in the heartstrings. Like, man, this is one of those great times where the Rebels, they feel so inspired. They feel so optimistic. And it's a great shot to leave off on killing, uh, uh, can't say his name, Kieran Gillen's last run of Star Wars. And this is going to be his last run for a while. And this guy, I want to give him props because he has done so much since day one, really, for the Star Wars brand on comics under Marvel in 2015. He started with the Darth Vader comics, which were huge, which brought in a character such as Dr. Aphra, which has been revolutionary pretty much for the series and brought in her and her own comic series and then took over this main line of Star Wars which has been great. He started off with that Jedi arc, he did the Mon Cala arc which is phenomenal and everything he's done for Star Wars has been really positive so it's going to be, you know, I'm going to miss this guy as far as being a creative force in the Star Wars comics but I'm sure this is not going to be the last time we see him but he does definitely deserve to get some time off for this series. Next up in comics, something that never disappoints, is Dr. Aphra, issue number 33. This is part two of Unspeakable Rebel Super Weapon, and we learn what the significance of this arc's title is in this issue. Not a whole lot happens as far as like characters moving on a timeline, but what it does is really give us all this awesome, rich information about what the Rebellion is doing, how they're feeling during this time of war, which is still in between the events of A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back. So we last left off where Aphra is being held at gunpoint by none other than Captain Tolvin, who we last seen was an Imperial, and now we see her as a Rebel operative, and we get into this this place where the rebels are holding out this nondescript place which they're keeping low and we see this big high-ranking officer bra brass of the rebellion right you have general kraken you have mon mothma you have all these big players of the rebellion and what they want from afra is this weapon that she acquired from the last issue called the far killer and it's basically a portable miniature death star sniper weapon and it originated from this this person that was back in the old republic anyway the rebels are planning on building this super weapon of their own to combat against the empire so that's why they want this weapon and that's basically where this issue leaves off is it does get into dr afra and it gets into having the rebels want to have her stay on board on their side and at the end of this she decides to walk away with vulada that little girl that she kind of took under her tutelage. So getting into all the awesome nitty gritty bits. First off, I really did enjoy those flashback sequences with Afra and her mother. So we didn't know about her mother too much until the last issue. So we're still diving deep into that relationship going back in the past when she was very, very young. And there's this awesome 
discussion that they have about the dark side and why it's bad and the mother has a different perspective on the dark side which i think is very interesting saying that the dark side is called the dark side not because they're evil they don't believe that they're evil when they're practicing in the dark side but they call it the dark side because it's you know shrouded in mystery there's lots of things that you can't see that you don't know of hence the dark side I also like about how her perspective on right and wrong like you know this the whole philosophical conversations between Afra and her mother was something I didn't expect but I thought it was really good and, and kind of delved into territory that I haven't really experienced too much in the canon of Star Wars up to this point I thought that the way the story was with the flashbacks intertwining with the present day events really helped emphasize especially with the previous events and in, in, in you know in the past going and emphasizing points that would happen in the present it was really awesome dichotomy going back and forth going back to these new characters or not new characters but characters that we know from star wars i love seeing general kraken this is a guy that was in the back of lando calrissian on the falcon door in the return of the jedi very minor role now we're actually seeing him brought into the forefront the dr Afra comics the star wars comics have done a great job of just building up these minor characters and giving them something more to do i loved hearing more about mon mothma and how they were constantly moving her because she's such a high-ranking target that the emperor was basically hiring assassins to try to kill her to try to take her out and they had to constantly move her also shout out to prune face anytime i see that character represented in some kind of star wars story i kind of just cheer and say yes he's back um this comic series has done such a great job with fleshing out the old republic so we have this character dr afra she's an archaeologist so it makes sense in this issue or in this series to go back in time and kind of explore what has happened so they are really just fleshing out the old republic and whenever they do decide to go into that we're going to see stuff like the corsair uh, hopefully the corsair wars which were mentioned in this and that's where this one guy this jedi he was using this weapon that he had somebody build for him that has a lightsaber crystal that's able to fire an incredible distance and cause a lot of destruction and he was using this thing way more than the jedi council at that time really wanted him to do and they basically deemed him to die after a while because it was just he was causing too much destruction but what i like about this weapon is that the rebels are actually going to try to harness this weapon into their own miniature death star so they want to try to replicate and 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 kind of um create like a mobile version of the death star it's a lot smaller that can be controlled by um like a starfighter so you see an image of like their concept is like these b-wings kind of towing along this spherical shape that looks exactly like a miniature death star and what they plan on doing it they don't need to destroy a planet what they need it to do is destroy emperor palatine if they can get close enough i guess to his throne room on coruscant they could take out the temple it might kill a couple thousand innocent people but in the long run the long scheme of games they think it's going to be something worth it and that's what i really dug into this episode really enjoying is getting to that rogue one territory where the rebels we thought all the way up until rogue one were these very good guys in white and you see what happens with cassian andor on rogue one and you know he's killing people in the name of the rebellion that didn't necessarily need to die so we're seeing a lot of this kind of come into play where there's a lot of great territory for the rebellion they are not as good as we thought they were initially they have to get the job done and if it takes killing a couple thousand innocent people well they're definitely gonna take that chance so again every time dr afro comes out with a new issue i keep saying it just keeps getting better and guys well it just keeps getting better so i can't recommend this one enough and moving on to another great star wars comic this week we have tie fighter issue number three this is the shadows fall part three this is again a tie-in with alexander freed's alphabet squadron which is now out definitely go read it i have my review up it's a great book so getting into this story we have squadron five they fly the tie interceptors they had a mission to go and try to find the star destroyer that wasn't checking in it turns out that the star destroyer decided to go rogue and all the imperials in that system decided that they didn't want to be part of the national or the loyalist empire or whatever so they don't want to do that they're going to have their own little thing on this mining colony so anyway our friends the squadron five end up saying look we're going to surrender to you guys rather than get killed and we're going to see what's going on and they the last issue they're talking to this admiral and he's explaining how he wants them to join their cause to not be part of the emperor's 
empire anymore. So anyway, they find out that they got out of there. They, they snuck out of there and they started, you know, trying to get back to their tie interceptors. And next thing you know, they get cornered, of course, by the stormtroopers or held at gunpoint. But we have the commander of Squadron 5 of Shadowing. His name is Bruce. And he is able to convince these stormtroopers that it's just not worth it working with this admiral and eventually the emperor is going to find him and kill him all so he said basically you guys can save yourselves now by letting us leave here and you know escape a lot of bloodshed you're not going to be liable you'll be relieved whatever so they do listen and that's what happens but not everybody in the empire in this area decides that they want to go through with shadow wings plan and there's ends up being a civil war big battle between imperial forces next thing you know they are getting sold out to the uh, the rebels. The rebels show up, and there's this big dogfight. Things go crazy. A couple members of Shadow Wing unfortunately die, but by the end of this, Shadow Wing is able to get on the Star Destroyer and get the hyperspace to bring it back to Shadow Wing to add to their arsenal, to add to the Empire's arsenal. And as always, we have another backup story. This one is actually focused on Bruce, and we see him talking with Major Kais, who I'm not going to spoil anything, but he plays a huge part in Alphabet Squadron. So definitely a great crossover moment there. And it's just talking about Bruce and about creating Squadron 5 as we know it and what happens between their relationship. So getting into the specifics on issue number three of TIE Fighter. And first off, seeing that there's so much risk and and peril involved with this issue. I mean, we have Zinn and Lighten both die in battle, both in their TIE Interceptors. It really hurt to see Lighten go because I followed this character in Imperial Cadet and plus I mean you know it's I love seeing characters make the jump to different stories and seeing him die this early on I should have seen it coming because there was another story where it was him and his brother I think it was last issue so they are already building an emotional bond and that's what I really enjoyed about seeing these characters die is because I've only had really two issues of these characters to really get attached to and in those two issues well i feel like there was an emotional attachment to I was like I seen these characters I was like really this sucks like I didn't want to see them go already and you had the character of Zinn who had this kind of love relationship with one of the other characters and I felt like that was done really well and to see that you know the male character there I'm not remembering his name to actually take that brunt is is pretty heartbreaking itself um seeing the cover page for issue number four coming up next month there is a y wing a b wing and an a wing i'm thinking that there might be a flash forward to where we might actually have some events in the alphabet squadron unfolding along the events of this maybe we'll have uh, the battle of pandem nigh if you guys know what i'm talking about or something like that um i do like seeing that bruce was able to basically you know get things going between um, these these imperials that were defecting and, and able to use his leadership to convince these guys that it's not worth it and to see his reaction of what happens when his squadron starts getting lost and we see that flashback where it really goes into and and it kind of interlinks with what is going on about how he wasn't going to leave anybody behind when he first put together a squadron five six months ago and now he, things aren't going exactly the way he wants um so just seeing all this action take place is awesome um i can't say enough good things about this issue there's great continuity obviously jody hauser and alexander freed must have been exchanging notes like all the time because the major kai is this big character he appears and he speaks pretty much exactly how i envisioned him by reading Alphabet Squadron, so I can really see the power now. I wasn't convinced when I was reading Alphabet Squadron with those first two issues of TIE Fighter that they were a great crossover, but I, I kind of should have held my tongue a little bit because now I think we're really gonna get into the meat of how these things really interlinked. Um, and, and also going back to the Empire Civil War. I love seeing that, um, not just because now I know I can pit my Imperials versus my friends Imperials in a game of Star Wars Legion and make it completely canonical sense. But it is cool to see that there's infighting even with the Imperials and, and seeing Stormtroopers fight Stormtroopers and TIE Fighters fight TIE Fighters. Like that to me is just some really cool stuff like that would come from my childhood where it'd be like, I want to have these two Stormtroopers fight. Like something I would just play with when I was, you know, six, seven years old, stuff like that. So anyway, yeah, TIE Fighter number three, 
great, great issue. I'm loving this series. Like, I'm loving this series way more than I expected it to, especially because the strong character development and, and seeing these characters and the reactions and the artwork that really emphasizes all these great points makes it something that I think is pretty much a must read. Moving over to my question of the week. This one comes to me on YouTube from Robin McCormick. He asked me, hashtag Star Wars Weekly, would it be great to see a story set after the Battle of Jakku where New Republic forces are hunting down Imperials still at large? So this interlinks perfectly with my prior comic review of TIE Fighter and Shadow Wing and Alphabet Squadron. So we know that Alphabet Squadron takes place a couple days after the Battle of Endor. Now remember, this is going to be a trilogy of novels. So I think we probably will see this happen. I think what we're going to see is maybe the next book we'll have to deal with maybe the Battle of Jakku. And then in the third book, maybe we'll go past the Battle of Jakku. Who knows? But I think that's definitely a possibility. As you see with the Mandalorian, or at least as what I've seen at Celebration, and the video is not out there officially by any means, is that the Imperials are still at large even up to five years after the events of the Battle of Endor. They're still out there. They're still trying to reclaim their territory in a way, still trying to assert their power, whatever remains of what they think is their power. So we're always going to have those those Imperials that still think they can last. And looking at this specific issue where you had the Imperials that defected from the Empire even before the Battle of Endor, even before the Emperor. So what's to say there hasn't been other sects of the Imperials that have done that before? Uh, I think we're going to find out that that's definitely going to be the case. So for sure, I would love to see that, especially with the New Republic, even though they are going to demilitarize themselves pretty soon after the Battle of Jakku. So next week we can look forward to Age of Rebellion Darth Vader issue number one as well as Galaxy's Edge issue number three. So what did you guys think of this week's comics? Which comic did you like the most out of all these amazing comics that came out this week? Let's talk about it in the comment section below. If you guys are new to the channel, I talk about Star Wars a lot. So if you like what I had to say about this video, make sure you go ahead and support the channel simply by subscribing. That is going to do it for me, Star Raptor. Thank you so much for watching. And may the force be with you always. Thanks for checking out the video. Please hit that thumbs up symbol. It helps me know that I'm making content that you guys enjoy. And if you enjoyed this video, I also include two videos down below you guys should check out. And please consider subscribing to this channel. It helps support me and it notifies you guys of when I get new videos up on the channel. You can also contact me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Star Raptor.